rap rock band with the DJ. Yeah, yeah. that's us, motherfucker. Somebody tell this band what year it is. New metal is easily the most popular version of the genre, with it being almost universally loved from everybody to Gen Z kids on TikTok, to millennials that grew up with Linkin Park AMVs on Daily Motion, all the way to Gen Xers like myself that were there to see the birth of the genre back in the 90s, and maybe even get our kids into it. So everybody loves new metal now, but if you're over the age of 30 or so, you'll remember that it was definitely not always like this. In fact, I would actually say that new metal was easily the most hated genre of music I've ever seen when it was in its prime. They said it wasn't real metal, that it was for white trash kids who grew up in a trailer park, and they very frequently threw around the word that starts with a W and rhymes with bigger. And the question is, why do people hate new metal so much? Was it just that they thought the music was corny or was there more to it? I think that there's actually a lot to learn here about, I guess what you could say, social psychology at scale, and in particular, the nature of in-group, out-group dynamics. And I will do my very best to explain all of that in this video. And also, I want to thank Timu for sponsoring this video. They're an online marketplace with the most competitively priced items in tons of different categories. They also have free shipping and free returns for up to 90 days. And you can download the Timu app right now at the link in the description of this video for even more perks and to shop my selected items. I just went on a little Timu shopping spree and here is what I got. These slides for $5.87 so I can dress just as cool as Tim from Polyphia. And this neck fan for $10.49 because I'm going to look hot in those slides. And this nose hair trimmer for $1.07 because with all the attention I'm going to get from the slides, I got to look my best and this edgy mug. New users of the Timo app can buy this three-in-one fast charging station for $1.34 and save $11 or more, which is a much better deal than other sites. And if you're already a Timo user, you can search my code for a $100 coupon bundle or click on my description box to see more offers. New metal is one of those genres where you can trace its origins back to one very specific moment, which is October 11th, 1994, the day that Korn's first album came out. And just to underscore what a huge departure this was in every way in terms of metal, compare it to what was at the time the dominant style of metal, thrash. Thrash metal was guys with long hair, pointy guitars, and extremely tight jeans, playing the most technical riffs they could, and oftentimes with sort of political lyrics about things like government corruption. But Korn just flipped all of that on its head. First of all, they wore baggy pants like ravers and rappers. Their music was very loose, almost to the point of kind of verging on sloppy. And instead of those super technical riffs like Megadeth or whatever, they played very simple, oftentimes single string riffs that really just focused on groove. And that album changed metal overnight in the same way as Nirvana changed alternative music overnight. Suddenly, Thrash was out, New Metal was in, and after Korn, bands like Limp Bizkit, Slipknot, Linkin Park, Static X, Mudvayne, and all the rest followed. Mixing metal with hip-hop, alternative rock, funk, and industrial. Which brings up the first, and I think most obvious, reason that New Metal was rejected. Because it was such a radical departure from what people thought the conventions of metal were supposed to be. I mean, you'll never find a Thrash fan that doesn't like Priest and Iron Maiden and stuff. They want to hear guitar solos. They want to hear, you know, epic stuff, you know, instead of just tuning as low as you can and going da -da 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 like that clip mentions one of the first and most obvious things is the complete lack of guitar solos something that had always been a really core component of the metal genre like when you thought of metal back in the 80s one of the first images that comes to mind is the lead guitarist standing there on stage silhouetted by the spotlight ripping this blazing solo that was almost like the iconic representation of metal. But new metal rejected all of that, putting the emphasis instead of solos on these really simple groove riffs. It's just one of those days where you don't want to wake up. Everything is, everybody sucks. 
And so I think part of the anger was coming from all these shredder guitarists who suddenly felt like they didn't have a place anymore. They'd spent all these years learning a skill that just honestly wasn't relevant anymore, which probably stung even more considering that that had already happened to them a few years before when Nirvana came out and pretty much killed hair metal overnight. But I think the hate for new metal actually goes deeper than that. One of the core values of metal has always been virtuosity, meaning that the culture of metal places a lot of emphasis on technical ability to play your instrument. For example, if you ask Megadeth fans why they like the band, a lot of them will tell you that it's because Dave and Marty were such great guitarists. But to put it bluntly, new metal obviously didn't give a shit about technical ability. Some of the biggest songs in the genre, like Blind or Break Stuff, have these just incredibly simple two note riffs that you could honestly probably play when you were in like eighth or ninth grade. And so that really highlighted another one of the ways in which new metal really rejected a lot of the things that defined metal, completely ignoring technical ability in favor of groove. And let's be real, some of these new metal songs, whether you like the genre or not, you just kind of can't help but nod your head when they come on. And so I think that gets to the real reason why people hated new metal so much, at least in the beginning, is because it rejected almost all the values of metal culture, both consciously and unconsciously. Another example of that was the integration of hip hop influences. And this was not an entirely new thing by any means. Rap rock collaborations had been happening for a solid decade before Korn came out, starting with Run DMC and Aerosmith doing Walk This Way. And then of course in 1991, Public Enemy and Anthrax doing Bring the Noise. But new metal took that to a whole other their level. With bands like Limp Bizkit, Linkin Park, and Slipknot actually having a DJ in the band, and in the case of Fred Durst and Mike Shinoda, vocalists that actually rapped. And that translated to their image as well. Instead of tight jeans, leather jackets, and high top Reeboks like the thrash bands, new metal bands dressed a lot more like rappers. Starting with Korn's iconic Adidas tracksuits, which as Jonathan Davis said, was an intentional move to really reject the conventions of metal. I liked the b-boy stuff. It was Run DMC, the breakdance culture, LL Cool J and Eric B and Rakim, that whole scene. Ultimately, what made me wear it was kind of a rebellious thing. At the time, in 1993 and 94, what did rock bands look like? It was the leather and all this shit. Everything we did was a complete opposite. And to say that that pissed off metal fans would be a huge understatement. If you were around back then, you'll remember how much people talk shit about them for having the hip-hop elements. And like I said, oftentimes throw around that word that starts with W and rhymes with bigger. And so yes, obviously racism was a part of that, but to me, it revealed something even bigger than that. It showed that metal had become everything that it initially set out to rebel against. It was just another social scene with these very rigid expectations of how you're supposed to look, act, and dress. And so in a way, I feel like their reaction to new metal was really just showing that the emperor had no clothes, that everything they were doing was really just conformity packaged as rebellion, basically like the goth kids from South Park. If you want to be one of the nonconformists, all you have to do is dress just like us and listen to the same music we do. Okay. But it wasn't just the fans. You heard a lot of the same things from the people in the old guard of metal bands themselves, who pretty much universally despised new metal and oftentimes specifically hated on the hip hop aspects of it. For example, Dave Mustaine said, I would rather have my eyelids pulled out than listen to new metal. Probably a bit extreme, but maybe the best example of this was Zach Wilde, who infamously went off on Limp Bizkit once when he was on stage. Wow, that's right, Limp Bizkit can suck our big motherfucking fat cocks. But what's interesting is that years later, he admitted that this was essentially driven by jealousy. He was mad that new metal had stolen the spotlight from his generation of bands. It's like they're like, well, Zach, you know, well, maybe if you're more like you know, Limp Biscuit. it would be an easier sell. And at the time, I mean, Limp Biscuit selling 60 gazillion records and they're the biggest band in the world. So, I mean, it, it, once again, it makes sense. But I go, so let me get this straight. So if I put a fucking Yankee hat on backwards, start wearing some fucking baggy clothes and put some Vans on and start going, yo, 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 that's going to fucking fix everything. I, I was like, you know what, go fuck yourself. And I just fucking walked out of the place. Which again is kind of the same thing that you heard from hair bands a few years earlier when Nirvana stole the spotlight from them. And on the one hand, that's totally understandable because I think anybody would feel threatened in that situation. Like, how couldn't you? But personally, I think it's always cooler to see the older generation of bands embrace the newer artists. For example, how Korn collaborated with Skrillex or more recently, Bring the Horizon, working with Baby Metal. If it wasn't for thrash metal, there wouldn't be new metal, even though I hate to say that because I am definitely one of those people that feels the same way as all the true metal heads do feel 
uh, new metal is not real metal, it's new metal. But uptight metalheads weren't the only people who hated new metal. It also got a huge amount of hate from the media who basically looked at it as an example of everything that was wrong with the world. For example, the British magazine NME called it the worst musical genre of all time. But I think this description from The Guardian really sums up how music journalists felt about new metal at the time. It had the ugliest bands, the ugliest fashions. Its natural home was vast concrete car parks across America where acts like Limp Bizkit and Slipknot stomped, swaggered, and growled before audiences that, according to their most vehement critics, had a tendency towards sexual assault, rape, and arson. And there's a few things in that quote that I think are worth looking at on a closer level. For example, how the writer said the ugliest bands and the ugliest fashions. There's an undertone to that that doesn't really sit right with me. Although I guess it's actually not really an undertone at all. He just said the quiet part loud. This smug indie journalist saying that new metal sucks because the fans were ugly and they didn't dress right. Like what is that other than the snobby, pretentious music critic version of Mean Girls? So that's against the rules and you can't sit with us. Whatever. Those rules aren't real. They were real that day I wore a vest, because that vest was disgusting. You can't sit with us! And then there's also the second part of that quote that says, its natural home was the vast concrete car parks across America, which I think speaks to the not so subtle classism that really undergirded a lot of the hate for nu metal. And let's talk about why that was the case. Most genres in rock start out as an underground movement in some place like New York, LA, or London. And it's initially only on the radar of hipsters and other people who make it their business to decide what's cool. For example, punk coming out of places like CBGB's in New York, or decades later, The Strokes. But nu metal wasn't like that. Like that quote kind of gets at, nu metal wasn't from anywhere cool. It was from what those smug critics would call flyover country, meaning the parts of America that these coastal elites would rather just fly over because they're too cool to even set foot there. Like Slipknot was from Iowa, Limp Bizkit was from Jacksonville, Corn was from Bakersfield, which is in California, but kind of might as well be Iowa. And when you think about kind of the archetypal nu metal fan, it's a blue collar kid from some place like Youngstown, Ohio, who doesn't know or care who the Velvet Underground or Ziggy Stardust are. He just wants to put on his disc man and listen to break stuff because he's pissed off at the world. And as we've seen over the years, the one group of people that it's socially acceptable to just absolutely shit on is them. That blue collar crowd from the middle of the country, or as people back then called them, white trash. People don't use that word anymore, but you can kind of tell that they would like to. And ironically, that sort of disdain and disgust that came through in the media actually only made new metal more popular because it made the fans correctly feel that the world was out to get them and look down on them. The fans actually found strength in the disdain from the critics and bonded over being those white trash fuck ups that nobody liked or wanted to be around. For example, that is exactly what the Slipknot song Pulse of the Maggots is about. And there was a second narrative about nu metal that basically painted it as this like frat bro music. As one so-called journalist said, it's considered the soundtrack for entitled white guys who fancied them the stars of their own coming of age movies, like a playlist of suburban self-pity but set to a funky baseline. Rolling Stone also included Limp Bizkit as one of their 20 frattiest bands of all time. And even Carrie King of Slayer repeated this narrative. I, that's a one record that I really paid not enough attention to because I was really bitter about what kind of music was popular. I thought it was was very frat boy stuff and maybe that's why it was popular, I don't know. Which ultimately led to nu metal being basically blamed for everything bad that happened at Woodstock 99 rather than blaming the promoters who created the circumstances for it to happen. In pop culture, there's this dark energy coming from young white males that entertainment is perpetuating. You have a crowd who are excited, inebriated, and you give them a band to help them release that energy. What do you think is going to happen? And this is despite the fact that none of the bands themselves seem to want anything to do with any of those associations. For example, Mike Shinoda of Linkin Park said, We never held the flag for nu metal. It was associated with frat rock. Arrogant, misogynistic, and full of testosterone. We were reacting against that. And if you look at a band like Korn or Slipknot, like, do you see anything there that looks anything like a frat bro? I don't know if you've ever been around a fraternity, but I can tell you they don't look like Jonathan Davis. And so the fact that this whole like frat bro narrative existed is very interesting to me because it's pretty much the exact opposite of the white trash narrative and they kind of both can't be true. 
What I mean is if frat bros are sort of these like rich, privileged kids that end up being the CEOs and bankers of the future, well, that kind of flies in the face of the idea that new metal fans are these like white trash losers that live in trailer parks, right? So which is it? Are new metal fans the rich, popular jocks and the frats, or are they the loser white trash kids with Jankos? The answer, of course, is that it's not that simple. With as many albums as these bands sold, of course you can find examples of whatever you're looking for in their fan base. Like just between Limp Bizkit and Linkin Park alone, they sold something like 100 million albums. And so of course there's gonna be some asshole frat bros somewhere in that 100 million people. That's just a function of statistics. But is that idea of the privileged, rich frat bro actually representative of the new metal fan base? I'm not so sure that it is. I think what's really going on here is that new metal became the punching bag for these journalists and critics and media types to project all of their insecurities and resentment over feeling left out in high school. I mean, if you think about the kind of people that write these articles, let's put it this way. They're not exactly the people that got invited to a lot of parties, right? And so when they see a band like Linkin Park playing these huge shows full of normies, or they see Fred Durst hanging out with Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears, I think it just triggers all those bad memories they have of everybody else going to prom while well, they stayed home and listened to the Smiths or whatever. Which brings me to the real point that I wanted to make with this whole video. To use all of this as an example of how just pointless and toxic this whole dynamic is. There's a term for it in psychology called outgroup bias, which to put it simply is the tendency to dislike and fear people who are outside our own identity group. And in particular, to view the members of the out group as interchangeable, as people who all share the same negative traits. For example, to say that all new metal fans are white trash or frat bros. And what's especially interesting about this in the case of new metal is that it's much deeper than just clueless outsiders making ignorant snap judgments about a subculture that they don't understand. Like when your normie cousin calls metal that kill your mother, kill your father music, you just kind of roll your eyes and ignore it because he doesn't know any better and he calls Metallica screamo and you're just like, okay, whatever. It's pretty easy easy to ignore those kind of people because it's just so dumb, right? They don't know any better. And so this stuff is much more frustrating coming from metal musicians and fans who do know better, or at least should know better, which gets to another really interesting concept called the narcissism of small differences, which refers to the idea that the closer two groups are to each other, the more likely they are to fight. Or more specifically, that we tend to fight with people who are very close to us more often than we do from people who are very different from us. For example, how gangs will fight with people from the next block over rather than people from across the country. Even though these are people who may literally have grown up together, they might even be related, but because you live on 13th Street and I live on 14th Street, we have beef. Or in this case, how the old school metal fans turned on new metal over what are really incredibly minor differences. Like in the eyes of your parents, it's all screwed. Screamo, right? To them, there is no difference between Slayer, Korn, and Blink-182. But in the metal scene, those are basically three different planets. Like, you could almost start a fist fight over that. And of course, you see the same thing in just about every other music scene. Like the dubstep purists versus the Skrillex fans, the deathcore kids versus the death metal guys, Blackpink versus BTS and K-pop, old school punks versus the Green Day fans. You get the idea. You see this stuff absolutely everywhere. And when you take a step back, hopefully you can see how silly all this stuff is. As one psychologist put it, often our hatred, fear, and contempt are directed at people who resemble us, while our pride is attached to the small markers that distinguish us from them. For example, hating on new metal fans because they wore Jenkos instead of tight jeans. Like, is it really worth disliking somebody over the type of pants that they wear? And this stuff is especially sad to see in alternative music scenes, where most of us were initially attracted to that scene because it gave us a place to belong and fit in when we didn't feel like we belonged anywhere else. Only to find that oftentimes, unfortunately, the scene was more judgmental than the high school bullies we were trying to escape. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos early. There's members only channels on my Discord. I do Q and A's, I do giveaways, and there's a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I will sign off for now, but I will see you next time.